Okay, well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody. Welcome to our adult education hour after church. Uh, let me say a quick word of prayer before I introduce our speaker and topic and we get underway. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for being reminded today to keep our eyes out for those places where you are already at work, even though it seems like the world is turned upside down right now. We know, and you promise that you are in fact at work. As we think about that, Lord, we also want to acknowledge the others that we meet, those who are different from ourselves, who believe differently, who live differently. How can we be neighbors to them? Teach us this day as we think about these questions, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you, yes, uh, to our uh, uh, Sunday morning uh, adult ed time. We have a guest speaker today who in many ways is not really a guest anymore. Like Stephanie said, you're kind of the annoying guest, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> no, but uh, Dr. Lori Brent Hale has uh, come and spoken several times. Uh, she is my other boss. Uh, over at Augsburg, where I adjunct, and she chairs the department. So I'm very, very happy to have her come back. She's also a dear friend. Uh, so I want to just uh, jump in and introduce uh, her to you, those of you who may not have heard um, about Lori. Uh, let me uh, kind of read through a little bit of uh, some of this, and then we'll turn it over. Uh, Dr. Hale is trained in philosophical theology and the philosophy of religion, and she specializes in the life and legacy of German theologian and Nazi resistor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. She currently serves as the vice president of the International Bonhoeffer Society English language section and is on the board of directors. In that role, she played a pivotal role in designing the new website, which is really awesome. Actually, you should check it out. It's very interactive. Uh, which was launched in June of 2022, and she continues to serve as the webmaster. She's the co-editor with David Hall of Dietrich Bonhoeffer Theology and Political Resistance. And this was the second volume in a series by Lexington Books called, the series is called Faith and Politics, Political Theology in a New Key. Together with Hall, she now serves as the editor for that series. Now at Augsburg, Dr. Brent Hale currently serves as the chair for the Division of Humanities and Fine Arts and teaches courses that meet general education requirements in the Department of Religion and Philosophy, including a class on Dietrich Bonhoeffer Theology and Political Resistance. She was honored, and I did not know this until I read, so I'm very proud of you. You deserve this, by the way. She was honored as the recipient of the 2022 Faculty of the Year Award given by the Augsburg Day Student Government. So you know it's good when the students say that you're good. So Professor Brent Hale is a member of the American Academy of Religion, the International Bonhoeffer Society, and is a scholar with the West Star Institute, Institute excuse me, God and the Human Future Seminar. Her talk today is called Rooted and Open, Doing Interfaith Work from a Place of Commitment. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brent Hale. Thank you, Christian. And thanks for having me back. I'm delighted to be back. I know I've seen some of you before when I've come to talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, and I will just mention that my co-editor, David Hall, uh, for the Bonhoeffer Theology and Political Resistant book, Resistance book is actually here as well, because um, he's also my husband. So um, he's sitting, what? Yeah, he's sitting back there. Um, so, so yeah, so Christian and David, if you need to jump in at any point and put me back on the rails, feel free to do that. Um, so I, um, I think the original idea to have this session came over a lunch conversation or something I had with Christian um, when we were talking about the um, the rich interfaith work that's happening at Augsburg and what that looks like there. Um, and I'm gonna say a lot more about that in a minute. And so we scheduled something, I think at the very beginning of last summer, and it happened to be one of those weeks where everybody was heading up north to the, 
or had been already headed up north to the cabins and, and whatnot. And so I think, were some of you, when we, I came, were some of you here that day? So we had a nice little, um, what, six or seven of us. So we actually just sat around a table and had a really lovely conversation. And you were there as well. Um, and I appreciated so much that conversation. And part of what we decided together as a group was that maybe I should come back when more people could, could attend. So here I am. That's why in the program, in the bulletin, it says this is an encore presentation. So, um, um, so I just want to um, say that what I plan to do today is tell you a little bit about my context at Augsburg, talk about what interfaith work is, um, ask you what you think it might is. I mean, this is going to be a little interactive. You might see that there are index cards on your table, so you're going to have a little work to do along the way. Um, and so introduce and, and discuss concepts of interfaith engagement and pluralism. Some of you may be very familiar with those ideas, and some of you may not be very familiar. That's always the trick with a session like this is trying to find that, um, that space where we bring everybody along, but people who are already thinking about these ideas are also engaged as well. Um, and so, uh, so we'll spend some time. I'll talk about the context. We'll introduce some terms. I want to get your questions. Um, I'll come back and talk about those terms and ideas a little bit more. Uh, we'll have some time for discussion. And then if, then if time allows, I also have a little bit I can bring Bonhoeffer and interfaith work together for a bonus um, if we want to do that at the end. Um, um, so here is a photograph of my department. This is the Department of Religion. These are the religion. Um, we're now a joint department of religion and philosophy, although we're, we're bringing in a new philosopher uh, right as we speak. We're in the middle of a search. So these are my religion colleagues. And we have an amazing time together, and I'm so delighted to be part of this group. And when I started, so this is my 26th year at Augsburg. Um, how, are, are you all familiar with Augsburg University in Minneapolis? So it is a church of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. It's a church-related college. And when I started uh, in 1998, um, I, I grew up in a Protestant United Methodist tradition. I was the first non-Lutheran in the religion department. And so I was kind of a, I was the stretch candidate, um, although I studied Bonhoeffer, who comes out of the Lutheran tradition. Um, but I think uh, the department really saw itself as the keeper of the Lutheran ethos of the institution. And while there were people being hired across campus in other departments from other religious traditions or no religious traditions, um, the department was still very tied to that Lutheran identity. And we still have strong, strong commitments as an institution and as a department to that identity. Um, but it looks different now. And so when you look at this picture, you'll see uh, Christians, Catholics, Protestants. Uh, I have a Jewish colleague, a Hindu colleague, a Muslim colleague. Um, and so we are actually um, at the forefront of of this interfaith work in our institution, right housed in our department. Um, and over those 26 years that I've been teaching at Augsburg, our student demographic has changed a lot, and very intentionally so. So this is actually the photograph um, from the homepage of our Interfaith Institute, which I'll talk about later. But you know, sometimes when you see college or university marketing materials, and you get a, a catalog or something in the mail or something online, and you see students of color, um, sometimes that's a misrepresentation. It's, it's uh, not indicative of the actual numbers of students that are at the school. Um, but this is a very good representation of our student demographics. So we had a record-breaking incoming class this year. Um, our incoming classes are ranging now in the about 650 students each in each first year class. They're hoping for 700 next year. 70% of our incoming class this year was BIPOC, so black, indigenous, and people of color. And so it's a really broad mix. And of those students, then, we have a lot of diversity, not only racial and ethnic diversity, but religious diversity. So again, I can track this from my time when I started. The, the traditional undergraduate students at Augsburg in the early 2000s, about 25, 30% Lutheran, about 25, 30% Catholic, another 25, 30% Christian denominations of a variety of, of identities, and then, I don't know, 
five or ten percent students who either didn't identify with tradition or identified with another tradition. We currently, and I did, I jotted these down um, so I could be fairly accurate. So right now we have about just under ten percent students who identify as Lutheran, about eight and a half percent who identify as Catholic, and about twenty percent who identify as some other. Um, with some other Christian denomination. So that's still about 40% of our student population. We also have 13% of our students are, Mus are, are, are Muslims. 8% um, identify with another religious tradition, and that leaves about 20% who then identify as non-religious. So that shift is significant, and, um, and in my experience, beautiful. It's made for cl classroom discussions and questions and explorations that are rich and deep and challenging. Um, and for the better, it has changed the way I teach. Um, I can't assume common, can't assume common uh, anything, really. Understanding stories. Um, and then we get cultural and religious divisions sort of, again, making that mix even more rich. So, um, you know, Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'll just say that. Um, all right, so, um, so here's my question. What is interfaith work? So this is my first question. What is, what is interfaith work? Let me just see, does somebody have a kind of a working definition for interfaith that you might want to throw out? Maybe it's too early in the presentation for participation. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll let you off the hook here. Um, so here is a, here is one definition. There are, there are many, but here's one definition. Interfaith work brings people of different faith traditions and backgrounds, and people holding non-religious humanist values together to work for the common good. Um, now, there's a lot to unpack here, but this is kind of a starting point. And so you may be familiar uh, with ecumenical work. I think about ecumenical work as people f within the Christian tradition from different denominations coming together. You might have had some shared services or Thanksgiving celebrations or something like that that were ecumenical. So interfaith is taking that both um, to other religious traditions, that common work, and including uh, people who identify as non-religious but want to be part of that conversation. Uh, there. Um, I also want to talk about this word pluralism. Is this a word? Let me just show hands. How many of you are familiar with this word? I mean, okay, so I know, so pluralism, um, plurality, diversity, those are facts. We live in a pluralistic society. There's lots, we can, we can mark differences in many different ways. We live in a diverse society, both, again, we can think about all the different metrics, including religious difference, that would identify help us identify diversity in a community, for example, or in a university, for example. Pluralism is not just the fact of diversity or the fact of plurality, it is engagement. So this is a definition coming from Diana Eck, um, who says, pluralism is an ethic for living together in a diverse society. It's not mere tolerance or relativism, but the real encounter of commitments. So again, a lot to unpack here. I'm gonna say more about this in a little bit. But pluralism, which is a, it's this idea of engaged, uh, it's engaged commitment, engaged interaction with difference, um, not just the not just the sort of recognition of it, um, is the is the foundation for interfaith work. And so, um, with this very brief, very brief introduction, I'd like you to just at your tables for a minute. Um, talk with one another. I put index cards. I think you brought in some pens, um, Christian, has yeah, so pens and index cards. Um, what do you know about interfaith work? What questions do you have? What concerns do you have? Sometimes thinking about engaging people from other traditions can be exciting, and sometimes it can be a little bit um, uh, fear-producing. And so what are your concerns, your joys, your fears? Uh, I'd like to just to get a sense of where you're at before I move on into the rest of the presentation. So I'm gonna give you, if you're online, um, please engage with the folks in your room and have the same kind of conversation and we'll come back together in uh, 10 minutes or so.
concept of pluralism includes God, reaching a God. Everything I've heard about pluralism doesn't have room for the atheist. Pluralism, as opposed to inclusivism or exclusivism, has a God at the top of the... Interesting. I haven't, um, I'm probably going to, what I have thought about or prepared to say is going to have a slightly different, we can have a discussion about this, and yeah. I have a slightly different take on that. Right. So, yeah. Um, and that's what they were over at Luther talking about. Right, and week. that was happened to be the president of Luther at the time, teaching that class. Oh, yeah. And he shocked me that he was willing to talk about pluralism. Then he asked the class. I had to say I'm pluralistic. Clearly not inclusivist. Inclusivist, a little hard to Yeah, so I mean, I actually have a slide coming up that has those three okay, terms on good. it. So you're, Great. You're, 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 uh, and you're it's okay. interesting, your definition of ecumenism. I've always thought of it more <laughs> interchangeable with interfaith. I, I, I've, I've never thought of it solely as a Christian base, but broader. It could, I think it could be. That could just be. Yeah. But, it, it, but it also could have been <laughs> the people talking about it didn't have a clear understanding. So just if, if I think about ecumenical activities or events, because I'm familiar with it, typically are just um, usually within Christian denominations coming together. But yeah, I, I mean, I can see that. But I think a, a lot of people use that and interfaith sort of interchangeably, okay. I guess, is that's what. That's actually, I actually like, I'm glad that that's the case, because then it yeah. makes interfaith it not. Makes it, a broader, it makes it a broader, broader. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and maybe that's more recent just because of the way things are in the world these days. Yeah, because so, right there has been yeah. more. Excellent. No, no, no. I'd like to thank you. What did you say? <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> I said, here, I'll, I'll no, 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 no. You guys no. were in the top. We were Yeah, we were. But what's your name again? Lori. 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 We were just saying, would you say again the difference between yeah. interfaith and ecumenical? I was just, I, I mean, I was just saying ecumenical typically is Christian, people from different Christian denominations getting together. Yeah. And interfaith. Christian. Yeah. yeah. And, and interfaith then includes people from other religions. Yeah. Well, that was so what I understood. Ecumenical doesn't go Christian Jewish. It, look, I think this, we were talking about this, maybe that's a semantic issue that we can. My, my grandfather was into, he was a Baptist minister, but he was into ecumenical. And uh, he used to go to, I, I've got pictures of him with a. With the yamaka, yeah, yeah. speaking Jewish. I actually Jewish. like that. I mean, like, let's 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 broaden the idea that ecumenical. That's that's. What's but happening. you had it kind of as well, Christian churches together. Yeah, broader. Just partly because I think sometimes people who are willing to engage in what they would call ecumenical work are worried about interfaith work, right? Or they get they get. What are they worried about? They're worried. Well, if it if it. If it has to do with how you hold your, if they, if they think you're going to get into a conflict with somebody from another religion, it's going to be an argument about who's right. If there's a concern about, yeah. She had a really interesting yeah. comment. Yeah. Yeah. You might want to say that right yeah. now. I, I, I would have more fear or, uh, let's say, nervousness about uh, a meeting with uh, real right-wing Christians than I would with other religions. Yeah, amen. <laughs> <laughs> is so you agree is with that? Covered in your interface, uh, <laughs> is that interface? Well, so this gets super tricky, right? Like intra-faith. Yeah, intra-right. Yeah, intra right. Intra so that's the thing. Intra-faith. Intra-faith dialogue can be more complicated than interfaith dialogue. Yeah. And that, can, that can happen within Christianity, can also happen within other yeah. Yeah. traditions. So, um, you know, my Muslim students who come from different parts of the world don't agree, don't always see things the same way. But, yeah, so this is where we want to be open. Maybe we need to give up on both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A new word. A new word. We're just going to talk right here. That's it. No, no, you know, and we do see in the news, Pope Francis is just yeah. throwing yeah. somebody out of the yes. Catholic Church. I, yeah. I thought that Whoa. was 
really a yeah. Who, who did who did Well, who that's what, there was a bishop who criticized him mm -hmm. a lot. And mm -hmm. an ultra-conservative ultra bishop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. Francis, Francis is, you know, kind of leaning out. Good. Yeah. 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 Pretty but that's, interesting. But that's gonna have
moved slowly for the last number of years to do use the, the courts instead of legislation. I mean, you see that in politics and so on. But the courts, well, a lot of the big cases that are changing the way our society is are really faith-based, well-funded, legal organizations. of what you're talking about. It was all about power and, and money. Uh, that's not good. The question about getting back to Peter, um, how does, how do true evangelical Christians who believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible and feel like they've got to be a known subject and absolutely be accepted at this point, how do they fit into the Okay. Okay. Test. Oh, yeah, here we are. I'm on. Okay. Um, thank you. So th thank you for these really, I was, I didn't make it to every table, but there's some really engaged conversations happening at the tables. And, um, and so, um, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to give Christian, I'm giving you and David homework. Um, can okay. you sort these into categories? So if there's yeah, similar David, questions, okay. you, I'm going to give that over to David. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you have a question, um, we'll see if we have some that link together. And so now that you have your questions, I'm going to say some more things uh, you have, you've been able to kind of tap into your own um, prior knowledge, your own thinking, your own questions. And so I might answer a couple of your questions as we go, but then I will circle back to make sure that if you have additional questions that they, um, they, they get voiced. Um, so these are terms, I was actually talking with a gentleman here about these terms. Um, to understand pluralism, you have to think about um, other, three other terms, two other terms, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. And so uh, when you hold a position, a faith P position, however, uh, whatever that might be, you hold it in a particular way. So this might be the commitments you have from your faith tradition, or it might be humanist values or ethical commitments, but you hold your, your beliefs and commitments either as an exclusivist, an inclusivist, or a pluralist, right? So an exclusivist, our tradition is the only truth. Right? So if, you're, if you hold your position exclusively um, uh, and you encounter somebody who has a different idea, what's that encounter going to look like? What's that conversation going to look like? What's that? Uneasy. Uneasy. One-sided. Contentious. Good word. Close-minded. What's your goal in a conversation, potentially? If you hold your position exclusively and you encounter somebody, conversion or shame, shame and conversion. You were trying to convince the other person that you are right and they are wrong. Um, can you think this rings true for you? You understand? You can think of maybe some examples of how this might go. No, none? Okay. I'm so glad you're here today. All right. Um, okay, so inclusivism. Uh, this is a little bit broader uh, canopy, I think that's the word I have used here. Our tradition is wide enough to include all others in a universal canopy. So this is a little bit more open. This is a little bit more, uh, you have a little bit more interest in talking to somebody else and learning about what they think and, and, and taking some of that in. But at the end of the day, at the end of the conversation, you're, you still think you're more right. And moreover, you think that those traditions can be kind of uh, reconfigured in your own language, right? In the, in the frameworks that you have so that, that they may say it differently, but they really think what you think, right? So you're kind of trying to bring everybody into this, um, this one way of thinking that is shaped by your own particularity, your own framework, right? Um, so then pluralism, 
is this idea that truth is in fact not the possession of any one tradition. Um, and so you are open. When you have that encounter with somebody with a different set of commitments and beliefs, you're open, you wanna learn from them, you wanna exchange ideas. Um, it's a give and take. The, the goal of that conversation is very different. Um, but you don't have, I think this is where people get uneasy is that uh, you feel like you might have to give something up to have that conversation. Now, you might be transformed a little bit in that conversation, um, but you can stay firmly committed to your own place and encounter the other who is firmly committed to their own position. Is this tracking? Um, but we want, to, um, we want to sort of dig in a little bit deeper. So Diana Eck... Uh, she is a professor at Harvard. She is the founder of something called the Pluralism Project, which is a, there's a great website. In fact, I might click over to it in a minute. It has a really awesome uh, set of resources on this website. Um, and she, I'm taking this from this book right here called Encountering God, A Spiritual Journey from Bozeman to Benares. So this is an academic Bozeman, Montana to Benares, India, a spiritual journey from Bozeman to Benares. So this is an academic book. This was written quite a while ago, 20, 20 plus years ago. It's been uh, reissued a couple of times. Um, and it's part academic engagement um, a monograph, but it's also part memoir. So she grew up, so she's um, Christian. She grew up in Bozeman, went to church youth camp, um, pretty provincial, right? You know, um, isolated kind of upbringing, beautiful mountains. Um, and in college, she did a study abroad trip to India. And, and she is now actually, a, she's an expert in Indian and Hindu traditions. I mean, that's her field of expertise. And um, through that encounter, she kept going back to India. She kept inter interacting with people from the Hindu tradition. Um, she said as she learned and learned more about them, she also learned more about herself and her own commitments. And so her, her conclusions, uh, this is what I was saying, thinking, diversity is a fact, pluralism is an achievement. Pluralism is active engagement with difference. It's more than just tolerance. Um, it's seeking understanding. It's not actually relativism, right? So it's not the case. This is the other fear I think people have when they th start thinking about engaging others across religious differences. They think, well, then everything becomes relative and then there is no truth, which kind of slides into nihilism, right? Where there's no nothing, there's no solid ground. So she, again, she outlines this chapter seven. It's a great chapter. Um, all these, uh, these points. Um, so it's not relativism, it re but it requires dialogue. So t think about this. I think tolerance, when you hear the word tolerance, um, what comes to mind in terms of, uh, is, this, is this a high enough bar? It's kind of passive, right? So I think um, it's, pl again, pluralism, which leads us to interfaith dialogue, interfaith engagement. Um, it has to be more than just tolerance. It's not just that the other person is, well, I'll tolerate this other idea. Um, she does say, um, my students, when we read this section, they find this kind of funny. She says, well, okay, if it's a choice between active hostility and tolerance, tolerance is better, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but it's, it's just too, it's too low, right? That bar is too low. Uh -huh. Here, I'll show you it real quick. I'll just click over. I think this is going to work, right, Matt? On the, okay. So here's the, um, here's the website. Um, so you can read some more about, these are some of the points I'm making right here. Um, it says pluralism is not just tolerance, but the active seeking of understanding across lines of difference. She also says it's not something called syncretism. So syncretism, uh, so if you're doing interfaith work, the idea is not to take a little bit, this is where you put different things together to make a new whole, right? So it's not just taking a little bit of this tradition and a little bit of this tradition and a little bit of this tradition to make something new that everybody likes. That's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Um, 
And that's not the goal. The goal is, in fact, to be standing in your own commitments and engaging with others. So she always, she actually never talks about pluralism generically. She always talks about committed pluralism. And then she moves that even to more specific. She talks about Christian pluralism or uh, Hindu pluralism. So it's always, you always name your own commitments at the same time that you're um, reaching out to talk to other other folks. Um, yeah. Um, the other the other part of this resource is if you click up here, there's a little tab called Religions. And when you scroll down, it has all of these different religions. When you click on each one of these, there are um, uh, pages. If we click on let's click on Buddhism, for example, then um, there's t like ten little articles. Each of these links are about one to two pages. It's an introduction. And then you can click on Buddhism in America. It's another tab with another 10 or so um, essays, very short essays, the Buddhist experience, and then issues for Buddhists in America. So this is specific to looking at these traditions as they play out in the United States. Um, but a really fantastic resource if you want to learn about some other traditions right away. Did you have a question? No. OK. Um, all right, so let's go back to the. Slideshow. All right. Now, um, Diana Eck talks about pluralism. Let's, uh, let's see if I can make this bigger again. Nope. Well, that you can all see this fine, right? Okay. Um, so here's another person who does work on does interfaith work. Somebody named Ibu Patel. Is that a name that you've heard before? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Um, so he is the founder and director of an organization called Interfaith America, formerly called the Interfaith Youth Corps. Um, he's a Muslim American with Indian um, heritage. And he writes, 100 years ago, the great African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois famously, famously said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. I believe that the 21st century will be shaped by the question of the faith line. On one side of the faith line are the religious totalitarians. Their conviction is that only one interpretation of one religion is a legitimate way of being, believing, and belonging on earth. Everyone else needs to be cowed or converted or condemned or killed. On the other side of the faith line are the religious pluralists who hold that people believing in different creeds and belonging to different communities need to learn to live together. So he actually makes a, a, a simpler division, right? Either you're an exclusivist, or in his well, harsher language, a totalitarian, and you think that you have the one way to think about truth, or you're willing to be open and engage with others. Now, he is an interested, he actually, in his work with, the Interfaith, with Interfaith America, which works a lot with high school and college age youth, He's not so interested in dialogue. He doesn't necessarily think people need to get together and talk about what they believe and sort of hammer it out. Or He thinks people should find common ground around common concerns and come together and work for the common good. And, th and then you build those relationships organically with people from other traditions um, to make a difference in the world. So he has a couple of books, a number of books out that you might find interesting. Um, he has one called Acts of Faith, talking about his experience as a Muslim uh, in America. And then he has a book called um, Sacred Ground that talks about pluralism and democracy and the relationship of those things. Um, he's been to Augsburg a number of times. And you know, it's so interesting. Um, the first time he came, he brought with him the, the woman who at the time was his um, like associate director for the organization. And she came out of a fairly um, conservative evangelical Christian background. And she told this amazing story that, um, th that she had, it was kind of a story of losing her faith and regaining her faith through her friendship with Ibu, through this, um, with his Muslim identity. She had gone to college um, in Northfield. I can't remember if she went to St. Olaf or Carleton, but one of those schools. Um, and this was 20, so 20 years ago or so. And she was um, involved in a, um, like a Christian student group. And so because she was the 
president, she actually was the president, and so she was on this mailing list, like a list serve that student organizations would get notified about certain things. And there was a business in the Twin Cities that was um, Hindu owned, that had been uh, like, a, like a shop, that had been um, the target of vandalism. And so they had put out a call for student organizations to come up, there was gonna be a cleanup day and they were gonna try to help this family kind of restore uh, restore their business, and so she put an email out to her group of conservative Christians. Maybe we call them exclusivist Christians. And the response she got back from some of her members uh, was something along the lines of, why would we go help those heathens or pagans or some not so great uh, way to think about who those people were. And it, it, um, it unsettled her. She walked away. She walked away from the group. She walked away from her faith. Um, I don't remember all of the, the dots of the, of the connect the dot story that got her into relationship with the interfaith group, but she was saying that it was through her friendship, her interfaith friendships, that she was able to actually reclaim her own Christian identity and stand in that space in a way that was different, that, in a way that was open, um, and, and therefore... Um, powerful in a way that she had really caught her by surprise. Um, all right, so here's from, from Interfaith America. Um, Ibu Patel says, faith is a bridge. Interfaith America inspires, equips, and connects leaders and institutions to unlock the potential of America's religious diversity. Again, you can, um, you can go easily to their website and find out a lot more about the work that they do. So we now have an interfaith institute at Augsburg. It's, um, it's been in a kind of a pilot infancy program for about five or six years, although the coursework that we've been teaching in the religion department for more than 20 years has been devoted to pluralist sensibilities and, and moving, moving us toward interfaith um, engagement with our students and with one another. Uh, but just uh, a year and a half ago, there was funding that came um, from the El Hebri family to endow a chair and executive director position. So um, I'm seeing Christian nod. So our common good friend and, and now colleague, Najiba Saeed, has come in as the director of our Interfaith Institute. And so um, you, can see, uh, you can see us at an opening event when we were still masked up a couple of years ago. And then in the corner of the picture, is kind of dark. That was last year. We have a a cohort of students every year that apply to be part of what's a group called the Interfaith Scholars. Um, and they meet um, every other week for a couple of hours for the whole school year. And so I was, I'm actually tucked in the back of that picture kind of by the window and Najib is on the front. So we did it together last year as she was transitioning into her position and now she's doing it this year. And um, she has been just a powerful voice um, both on our campus community and across the nation and even internationally for interfaith peace building and um, cooperation. So um, I will say that she and my uh, colleague Shana Scheinfeld are carrying a very heavy load right now um, as we are trying to support our student, our Jewish and Muslim students as the conflict in the Middle East continues to, to rage on. Um, so I want, again, if you, um, Interfaith at Augsburg, you can, there's a website with all the events. There's a lot of public events. Um, so if you're interested in being, um, there's, I'm sure there's a mailing list and you can also just go online if you're interested uh, in attending. She's been opening for the Interfaith Scholars this year about once a month. She has a speaker come in that she opens then to the public, so not just the class. Um, so Busho Lan was there a couple weeks ago. He's a Buddhist priest here in the Twin Cities, uh, has a new book out, and for example. Um, so, so I, I wanna say a little bit more about how this work comes from our institution, um, and again, I'm partly, I'm not trying, this is not a commercial for Augsburg, although if that, if it were, that's fine. I mean, uh, if you have uh, kids, grandkids, neighbors who want to come. Um, but I want you to think about what it means to be a faith-based institution that is committed to this work. And this is why the talk today is called Rooted and Open, right? How do you be rooted in your, in your position and open? And so our 
university mission statement. It starts like a lot of other university mission statements. We want our students to be informed citizens, thoughtful stewards, critical thinkers, and responsible leaders. Um, but if you look down, we, and there is a line in there about that we are committed to intentional diversity, and we are. But it says we are also defined by excellence in the liberal arts and professional studies and guided by the faith and values of the Lutheran Church. And so the, there's a network of uh, Lutheran colleges and universities, ne NECU, Network of Evangelical <laughs> Lutheran uh, Colleges and Universities, This has done a lot of work to think about um, what it means to be, again, to be rooted and open. And so there's a document that you can find online, it's only about eight pages long, that lays out this idea that, um, that we think our graduates should be called and empowered to serve the neighbor so that all may flourish. And that all is expansive. It's a, it's a big idea that includes people from all different religious traditions. Um, and, and so I was actually the, the, I was at the 930 service. Um, the first uh, um, piece that the choir sang if you didn't have a chance, if you weren't there, if you have, a, if you were there, if you've had a chance to read the um, the the lyrics, the text. Thank you. I couldn't think of the word. The text. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it is beautiful. It, I think it's an expression of this kind of rootedness and openness, right there in the text of that um, of that song. Um, and so part of this is that. Um, that we can as an institution be rooted in those, these deep commitments. But it says in that last paragraph, because this calling names our common institutional identity and mission, rather than the religious affiliation of individuals, um, we can help all our students um, engage in this work to be called, to be empowered and to flourish. And to, again, to think really expansively about what that all means. Um, there is also theological warrant coming out of the Lutheran tradition about freedom and the gift of grace, which I think would resonate with the folks here in this um, um, community about this freedom for the other that, again, crosses those um, sort of stark boundaries that are set up when you start making exclusive claims to truth. Um, all right, we'll stop on the Bonhoeffer thing for right now. Um, I will say that Diana, one of the other things that Dianek does in this book that I, I find very moving and powerful is she interrogates this word credo, or the I believe statements that lead to our creeds. And she says, well, we, you know, we have credo statements where we make faith claims. I believe in the Father, I believe in the Son, I believe, right? Um, but she says, if you if you look at that word, that it's actually more accu accurately translated as "I give my heart to." I give my heart to, and so our faith. Our f I keep using the word commitment. You've that's been on purpose, right? So she says that um, she's talking a lot about faith commitments rather than intellectual assents to certain beliefs about what is true and not true. And so you give your heart to. Um, these claims, and when you think about it in those terms, engaging with somebody who has given their heart to a different set of claims because it becomes a different conversation than if you're trying to have an intellectual debate about um, a particular doctrinal or dogmatic statement. Um, okay. Um, I'm gonna ask for questions now. Are there some, are some categories of questions? <clears throat> yeah, so I, this is rough and ready, me spitballing things. Okay. But um, so I would say you, you've been in the middle of talking about this one. You might want to stay with it. Why is Augsburg committed to interfaith work? Okay. If you're in the middle of talking about that. Um, I think there's folks are interested in sort of how to do it. Mm -hmm. Are there techniques? Okay. Um, uh, how do we negotiate the pluralism versus syncretism a bit? Um, uh, sort of um, what we aim for, like how do we how do we talk about common values, or do we have to have common values mm -hmm. and engaged in interfaith work, right? So how do yeah. we do it? Okay. 
what do we aim for? And then, and then there's a, another pressing category of how does it help us make sense of the dumpster fire that we're living in. Got right it, now. right. Okay. Well, I will. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, I may have to have you refresh my memory as we go, but um, I'll just, so just to kind of um, maybe make a final statement about Augsburg's commitment, I will say that Augsburg's understanding of its Christian slash Lutheran slash church related identity, that we do interfaith work not in spite of that, but because of it. And that this, um, that we do interfaith work not in spite of our Christian identity, but because of it. Um, and so that, um, that the call to serve the neighbor, that, so we also talk a lot at Augsburg about vocation, about the sense of calling. And, and I think the shortest hand way to say that, you know, because a lot of times we talk about vocation as our passion and our gifts and our talents. And that's true. I mean, you should, that should be the case. Um, but that's only part of it. It's, it is about you, and it's also not about you. It is about your neighbor. And so um, we are deeply committed to thinking about the neighbor in, in all of the ways we possibly can. And we're situated, I mean, if you haven't been on our campus lately, we're in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. Our neighbors are Muslim. I mean, that's who our neighbors literally are. And so um, we have to be in relationship um, with those folks and others. We also have a... Um, a growing, I'm, I'm noticing it. I'm noticing it a lot this year. But our commitment to Native students is also um, growing. We have one of the only urban reservations is just a mile, less than a mile from our campus, and so um, that's another sense of. They bring a whole another sense of um, spirituality and understanding, which actually brings me to the how do you do it? Um, well, there's lots of, and there's a. I could. There's a lot of answers to that question. Um, in my class this semester, I'm teaching a class called Religion, Vocation, and the Search for Meaning. Christian teaches that class for us in the summertime. Um, and, and so I'm teaching it, and we have some different kind of tracks to that class. So I'm teaching it as a, my emphasis is on global religious traditions. So we, uh, I introduce briefly, it's just a taste of a lot of different um, religious traditions. And I want to get students to the point where they can be asking these kinds of questions about engagement. And so we actually start um, by reading together a chapter from Kao Kalia Yang's The Late Homecomer, which is a Hmong family memoir. If you're familiar, she's a local St. Paul author. And she writes, there's a chapter in that book about her grandmother's traditional Hmong funeral, and uh, which includes a shaman, and a lot of, there's a lot of ritual involved in that. And so we read this pretty early in the semester together. And then I invite students, with all the caveats about if you've lost someone recently, this is going to be a really hard conversation. Um, but then we talk about funeral traditions and experiences. And, and that, um, what's happening is that as people are sharing their stories, they're deeply held um, these are meaningful, powerful um, stories of, of people's families. These are tied to their religious traditions and tied to their what, how they make meaning in the world. And so all of a sudden, they're having conversations that are, in fact, interfaith conversations um, before, we've before I've even introduced that idea. And so it kind of paves the way then... Um, you know, for us to then start thinking about different traditions, and then we start noticing, well, what are some? We, we talk about characteristics of religion. So, what are some characteristics of religion broadly construed um, that are always those? Whenever you do anything with categories, it's always messy, right? No, nothing's ever a neat. <laughs> there's always blurry lines between categories, and it's never a complete list. But then, as we start reading about the traditions, then you can start making, well, okay, so, oh, it's interesting that the. The Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, think about time chronologically. There's a beginning. There's stories of creation, middle, an end, a hoped-for end. But the Eastern traditions, for example, Buddhism and, and Hinduism, understand time cyclically, right? There's this idea of samsara. And so just even having that, you know, starting to have those kind of conversations, paying attention to and noticing what's the same and what's different and sort of looking for those common... Um, common ways, again, that people are making meaning. It just really opens that up. So um, I don't know if I'm getting to, you know, how, but I'm, um, 
and, and then just inviting those conversations. I mean, the hard, bless you, the hard thing about, um, so I have a built-in way to encourage people to be in interfaith engagement because I have people from every different tradition right in front of me in class. Um, if, you're in a, if you're in a space where there aren't people from other traditions, you have to seek that out. And, and maybe the way to seek that out is to, um, you know, pay attention when you're at meetings, if you're at a school board meeting or a city council meeting or at a, um, an event, you've gone to watch a play or a swim meet or something, and there's somebody, you know, so you, you just have to sort of start having conversation with people. Really, interfaith work is just conversation at the end of the day. Um, so that would be some thoughts about, um, you know, uh, how to do it. Yes. Um, so the, you and I have talked about this, so I'm going to throw something out there and see if you want to grab a hold of it. Okay. Right? So Diana Eck and Ibu Patel have different understandings about what interfaith work aims at. Right. Right? Okay. He's like, Ibu Patel is like, we don't, we don't have to sort of figure each other out. Rather, let's, let's, let's see where our understandings of the common good overlap, right. and then let's address, let, let's try to bring that about out of our faith traditions. Correct. Right, so he's work-oriented. Diana Eck is like, let's just, let's just talk. Let's try to figure each other out more and see how our, we, not, not how our traditions in a, necessarily interact or overlap or let's just understand each other more mm -hmm. right so those are two models it, of how we go about it and what we aim for right and right, maybe so, maybe that helps well, yeah so i think, think about right so what, yeah what so the goal, right so for the goal so if you're thinking about what i was just saying about how to like what's your what, yeah what's your goal so ibu patel he doesn't Again, he's he's not going to lift up dialogue as the most important part of interfaith work. He's going to he's going to lift up action, community service, working for the common good. Diana Eck is going to lean, and this is her academic <laughs> leaning. She's going to lean more into the into into dialogue. I mean, I think actually um, our own interfaith institute at Augsburg offers kind of a middle path through through those two views, right? Where um, there's certainly um, an interest in understanding one another, getting to understand why certain things are important. And, and, and actually one of the things that, the, uh, sorry, that Najiba has done, uh, it was in process before she got here, but you know, everyone's, every, there's no capacity, right? At some point you don't have enough hours in the day. So one of the things that she picked up the ball on and finished was creating an interfaith curriculum for our nursing program. Because, he, I mean, here's another reason why some of this work is important. If you are taking care of somebody who is in a um, life or death situation or who has a, a, an illness, um, it's really helpful and important to understand what is meaningful for those people and those families in terms of who should be in the room, who's making decisions, what are important rituals, what is, you know, that matters. And so she's, so, so that's a sort of practical on the ground. Let's make our lives to, again, this is like, let's make our lives together, um, good lives together, you know, and not let these um, differences get in the way. Um, so she's, so that's one thing she's doing. She's also, again, she's interested in, and she's interested in the dialogue, but she would land where, Ibu Patel might land on the community service and working for the common good. Najiba's doing that work too, but really framing it, I mentioned this in terms of peace building. That it's important, religious, religious differences can divide us, can create divisions, can create violence. Um, how can religious, engaged, pluralist, interfaith interactions um, help us, and, this, and Patel talks about this too, build bridges of peace and connection. Christian. Yeah, I just, uh, I wanted to, Mina Jiba comes from Kashmir, where religious violence between Hindus and Muslims, you know, is sort of part of that background for her. One of the things that has struck me in terms of engaging Patel and Diana Eck, and I can't just echo what you said about the Pluralism Project is a fabulous website. I use it in my class as well. But there's a kind of consistent um, 
connection between this work and having a healthy democracy. And I wonder if you would maybe talk a little bit about that connection as a part of this. Um, yeah, sure, that sounds like a dissertation maybe, but. Um, <laughs> um, well, listen, I mean, if we go back, I mean, f for me, this is this is this is going to sound maybe a little cliche, but the first four elements of our mission statement: what, why are we educating students? So, and you can think about this in terms of Augsburg or another institution, or um, or in any context. We need people for a healthy democracy to be informed, to be responsible, to be critical thinkers, and what's the last one? Thoughtful to be thoughtful stewards. And so. Um, I can't really separate out this interfaith work from any of those things, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, um, the, uh, the other sort of, I guess, a sensibility that's built into this work is, is an intellectual humility, right? This recognizing that we are, in fact, um, we're all limited in certain ways. We're limited by our experience, by uh, our social locations, and that we get more information and learn more about the world and about ourselves and about um, ways to solve problems the more we interact with people who have other social locations, other commitments, other beliefs. And so to be, um, to be willing to engage in this work, to be willing to say that I actually don't have the bead on the whole truth, um, which is the, you know, sort of the upshot of this, is to say, um, I'm intellectually humble enough to, to engage with others, to learn from them, and that's going to make me a better citizen in our democracy. I'm going to be able to vote better. I'm going to be able to um, uh, make more responsible choices uh, kind of across the board. So that would be my answer. Yeah. Um, Hold on. Project in Minneapolis. Could you touch on, um, I think it's called the Interfaith Project um, with Minneapolis Council of Churches or something there's, like that? Um, there's a multi-faith network, um, and there's... It's Interfaith I, Action. Interfaith Action. Which used to be the St. Paul uh, Co uh, Council of Churches, I think. Okay. It's the Interfaith Action Network, I believe is what it's called. Okay. I've done this a couple times in, um, during the Muslim holy time. They have these dinners that you can sign up to go to and you know go through their 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 um, ceremony and things and then eat and these wonderful conversations and it just is really very cool that and that's just Muslim I'm sure there's probably other and th there was something about encouraging people to just have a dialogue with other people of other faiths and stuff so um, yeah, I, um, so actually two things. One, um, I can send some links to, to Christian to share. Um, my colleague Matt Maruji is really involved in some of those networks and I you know just, just presented at a conference um, in the last couple of days, but I haven't, I haven't been plugged in as much, so I can't really speak to that. But I actually, I just I have an idea, <laughs> which is my students this semester, so I have two sections of this class um, that I'm teaching. Uh, so I have up between 55 and 60 students um, in, together in these two sections. And they have an assignment coming up in a couple of weeks where they have to do an interfaith interview. So I have a lot of students who are not Christian who are looking for conversation partners. If you were interested in being a conversation partner with one of my students, I would love to get your email. Um, and so maybe I can get a little list yeah, going. Totally. That would be fantastic. And I it would also, be great I for my students, but it would also be an opportunity for you to talk to somebody. Yeah. I, and you know this, but I, I, I basically use your assignment too. So maybe I'll talk to some of you as well at the <laughs> yeah. end of the next summer. Um, was there one more set of questions that I did not get to? I think my time is up right now. It is pretty much up, yeah. It's <laughs> you know, I just, I mean, this is where, um, so here's, here's what I'll say about that. I will say, first of all, I just want to separate out 
so if we're talking about Israel and, and Palestine, I want to separate out. I want to separate out that the people of Israel and the Israeli government, and the people in Gaza and Hamas are not the equivalent. Those are. We need to make those distinctions. Um, and then I just want to. That's what I thought I said, but that's what I, that's what I meant. <laughs> okay, that's what I meant. So thank you for the clarification. Um, and so knowing that there's a long history of religious conflict in that region, um, I'm going to say that what we're looking at now has to do with socioeconomic, sociopolitical uh, land and politics. And so, I, so pardon? Which is yeah, and so I mean, and so I'm not. I am not. I'm not at all. I'm not equipped to to really. I'm just not equipped to answer a question like that. But in my my deep hope, my deep hope is that this work, in general, in all places in the world, does matter. It matters where people can build bridges and relationships and see each other uh, as the humans um, deserving of dignity that they are, and th that um, our religious identities are, are only one, one part of our identity, and that we're all, we all share a human identity that, that sort of transcends those differences. And that's my, that's my deep hope, that this work does matter for building, uh, for building the, a kingdom that we would like to live in, I guess, is the way I'd put it. So. We have time for one more question, if there is one. I will, can, I, can I say, I will, I will say, for those of you who've been to my, so I, will, I won't go through the whole of the slides, but for those of you who have been to my Bonhoeffer sessions, you will know that he is, he was pretty exclusively Christian. Like, I mean, his, his I mean, he was. He was not doing interfaith work. He was interested in ecumenical work. He was not doing interfaith work. But he did say, um, let me just get to the, for me, the main issue for individuals and for peoples is whether or not they have learned to live with other human beings and peoples. That's more important to me than all their ideas, thoughts, and convictions. And I think that is something that we should all strive for. That's a great word to end on. Thank you so much, Lori. <laughs> you just say a quick uh, pray us out. Lori, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the challenging and also informative discussion that we had guiding, uh, being guided by our, our guest, Lori, and, and her husband, David, here, being here as well. We ask and pray that you be with us now as we go forth in Jesus' name to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. <laughs>